Shanks was actually the one who's responsible for Loki getting loose. I think Loki is heavily involved in how Shanks became a Yonko, but let's work this out together. So chapter 1131 confirmed that Loki has been stuck in the underworld for six years. Six years. This is critical information because we know that this isn't the only important thing. This isn't the only big thing that happened six years ago. We know from chapter 957 that it was six years ago that Shanks became a Yonko. Are these two things a coincidence? Did they coincidentally take place at the same time? I think not. And given that we now also know from chapter 1131 that these two, Shanks and Loki, share some sort of history. Let's just call a spade a spade, you guys. There's no way that these two things are unrelated. But I do think that this isn't the only important thing that we found out from chapter 1131. In fact, I think there is a lot of dialogue here that inadvertently revealed or suggested suggested, heavily hinted at some extra lore. Lore not just about Shanks' rise to Emperordom, but also lore concerning the history of Elbaf, its cosmology, its creation story. Things that I think relate to the story of Elbaf and their belief in the sun god. Things that I think are going to directly take us to the Ragnarok, that impending doom that we fans know for sure we're going to see at some point. So let's go through all of this information. Let's go through some of these ideas is my crazy Elbaf Shanks theory. But before we do, if you're a fellow One Piece fan like me, and let's face it, if you click this video, then you most likely are a big One Piece fan like me. Make sure to hit the subscribe button. This means you won't miss out on my One Piece discussions. And it also means that you'll help me reach my goal of 100k subscribers, which is a good thing for both of us because that means I can finally stop doing these plugs and interrupt our discussions. Okay, so in chapter 1100, 31, we find out that the underworld is also known as the primordial world. This, I think, is super important. Primordial means ancient. It means the earliest. It means the first of something. And Loki calling the underworld the primordial world suggests that this is the first world to exist. Now, whether he says that because he means that the underworld is the first land in all of Elbaf to exist, or whether he's actually saying it's the first land in all of the One Piece world to exist. Now, that's not so clear. I guess if it's the first in all of the world to exist and that by, you know, logic means that it's also the first of Elbaf to exist. And either way, it means or it has different significance for different reasons. And I'm sure as we get more information about the underworld, about Elbaf and about, I guess, the geography of the One Piece world at large, we'll be able to unpack that a little bit more. But for today, for this discussion, what I'm really interested in is what Oda intended by including this very lore-laden world word, law-laden term into his series. Because at first glance, taken at face value, you could just assume that Oda designated the underworld as the primordial lands just simply to emphasize the darker and the less stable environment that Luffy currently finds himself in. You know, if you say that something is the primordial land, it suggests that it's darker, it's rougher, it's less stable. It emphasizes the idea that Luffy is currently in an environment that predates civilization. It predates society. Everything is a lot more dangerous here. And that, in turn, makes Luffy's feat in taming the wild beasts of the underworld that much more impressive. He's been able to stand up against, you know, these ferocious beasts of the underworld, showed no fear and, you know, was able to befriend them, was able to tame them just like that. But knowing what I know about Norse mythology, and I say that with a caveat because I am by no means an expert, I have just dug into Norse mythology mythology a lot as of late, especially because of the Elbaf arc. But knowing that Oda obviously has done the same thing and he has buried himself in the books, he has been on the internet, he's been researching Norse mythology. I know that he knows that you can't just throw in a term like primordial flippantly and not start raising eyebrows. It means a very important thing within Norse cosmology. And the first thing that it made me think of, the first figure in Norse mythology that this term primordial made me go back to, was this figure called Ymir. Ymir was the primordial giant. And I have made another video that unpacks Norse mythology in greater detail. And I also do discuss Ymir in that video. So I do strongly recommend you to go watch that video if you haven't already, because I do think it is quite helpful, not just for understanding Elbaf's connections, but also a lot of other things coming our way. But for the purposes of today, Ymir is this primordial being that is the birth of all of Norse cosmology. And though he 
was a giant, he wasn't one of the gods. Yumi was this evil giant, was this evil creator, creation being. He was an evil that Odin, who is now known as the Allfather of all the Norse pantheon, Odin and his brothers defeated Ymir and that gave birth to the entire Norse cosmology that we know today. So then I started thinking, is Oda bringing in this idea of the primordial being, is he bringing in the idea of Ymir to double down on his portrayal of Loki as being this supposed villain? Is he trying to emphasize this point that Loki is actually evil? And then I started thinking about it deeper and I went, hang on, because although Loki currently finds himself trapped and it seems like he grew up in this primordial world, what we're really finding out is that the underworld is primordial. The underworld is the birth of all of civilization. And I started unpacking what that really means. If the underworld is where all of Elbaf began, can we also start to think that this is also where all of war began? Is the primordial underworld the birthplace of war? Because Elbaf is already also known as Warland. We've had lots of descriptions, we've had lots of dialogue, lots of comments that Elbaf is known for its violent, conflict-ridden, really tough Viking-like culture. Loki even says that when he describes Elbaf in chapter 1130, he describes it to be a nation that once lived and breathed warfare. But what if we take this a further step and we actually say that this underworld in particular was the birthplace of all wars? Because if you dig deeper into the way that Loki actually describes the underworld in particular, he says that this is a place that has existed for tens of thousands of years. And more importantly, he also says that this is a place where even the sun doesn't exist. And I think that that is another important comment. I think that's our second very important comment that we have to take into account here. On one hand, again, if we just choose to take it at face value, you could just suppose that Loki is exaggerating how dark, how rough, how dangerous this place is. It's a place where even the sun doesn't shine. That's how cruel, how dark, how malevolent this underworld is. But if you start thinking deeper and if you start unpacking what the sun represents, and we can choose to interpret this in two ways you can interpret it both in terms of what the sun represents for Elbaf as well as what the sun represents for the world more generally. We know that the sun obviously has a lot more significance. If we start thinking about it that way it suggests a whole lot more about the nature of the underworld, about its history. Because let's think about it in terms of Elbaf, right? We know that sun god, the sun god, a sun god is worshipped in Elbaf. We know that they already know of the existence of Nika as a sun god, where the sun god Nika Nika is the sun god that they're celebrating as part of their solstice. That's not quite clear, but we do obviously know that there is this heavy respect, a huge reverence for the god. We also know based on a chapter much, much earlier in the series, all the way back from the Little Garden arc, religion is super important for Elbaf. We know this because the fight between Dori and Brogi, this is a fight that they've engaged in based on the belief that the Elbafian god is going to determine their outcome because they can't decide for themselves who is the strongest who's the most honorable, they've passed that on for the gods to decide. And as of now, I think we can only say that the sun god is the only true god that we know for now to exist. You know, we have been introduced to these ideas of the rabbit, you know, the ear god in Elbaf, but that seems to exist only in Rodo's fake diorama world and not the Elbafian world at large. So for now, as of this point, the sun god is the only one that we know for sure that Elbafians believe in. And so if we know that the Elbafians also have this religion where they rely on a god to determine the outcome of their battles, to determine who is right, who is just, then I think you can interpret Loki saying that this world, that this underworld as being sunless, you can equate that to also meaning this world is lawless. Now, let's extrapolate this and let's also start thinking about what the sun means for the world at large. The most obvious, the first thing that we're going to have to look at is this existence of the sun god Nika. We know sun god Nika Nika is the warrior of liberation. We know that he represents freedom. He represents joy for those who are enslaved. He represents peace because he brings hope and he brings peace to the minds of those who are oppressed. He gives them hope that they are going to be saved, that they're going to experience freedom. And so, in that case, to say that the underworld has no sun, in that case, you can bring in a whole lot of different, a lot of different interpretations. You can say, you can equate that to mean that 
that the underworld has no joy, it has no peace, it has no hope, it has no freedom. In other words, you can say that the underworld isn't always dark, always violent, always oppressive, it's always violent, it's always at war. And that's how I started thinking, perhaps this means the underworld is the birthplace of war. So then I started putting these pieces together and I decided to take a stab at Elbaf's cosmology. I started to take a stab at the creation story, its origin story of Elbaf. If we know that the underworld was the birthplace of all of Elbaf, we now also know that this means that Elbaf was originally an always dark, always oppressive, always violent, a joyless place. It was a life without light, it was a life without peace, no joy. That is, until came the sun god. The sun god must have been a being that lifted Elbaf out of its darkness. The sun god introduced law, it introduced society, it introduced civilization, it gave Elbafians peace, it gave them joy, and it was the sun god that allowed Elbafians to develop into the glorious, into the honorable, into the thriving population that we now know Elbafians to be. It obviously doesn't mean that it completely robbed them or completely took away their violence, that remained an important part of their culture, but Elbafians developed to be so much more than that. It's violence with honor. They live brutal lives with a code. You know, their lives have so much more meaning. And this then also explains Elbafian's great respect for the sun god. Because at the end of the day, the sun god is the god that created life. Not just a miserable existence, but what it means to truly live for the Elbafians. And then that then explains why all of these figures like Rodor, why like Loki, they all want to be the sun god. Because the sun god is at the top. They all want to be Elbaf's most revered, most worshipped, most important deity. But then this becomes quite interesting because then it seems like Loki has almost contradicted himself. He stated multiple times now that he is Elbaf's sun god. He is that sun god of Elbaf, and yet he's currently trapped in the underworld. He is supposedly this sun god in a world where even the sun does not exist. And while currently that's explainable because he's obviously trapped in the underworld because he's about to face his sentence of execution for killing his own father, he has also said in chapter 1131 that he he actually grew up in the underworld. If the underworld is a place without sun, he as the sun god actually thrived and, you know, started to make friends and tamed the beasts of the underworld. How does these two things make sense? And obviously there is a much more obvious explanation as to why Oda would introduce that sort of detail. It's because he wants to make the parallels between Loki and Luffy that much clearer. This was very much on display in chapter 1131. You know, we get these details of Loki forgetting Luffy's name. That's very much a Luffy quote. And it's hilarious because Luffy gets annoyed at Loki for doing it, even though it's something that he constantly does to other people. We get it in other ways. The fact that when Luffy faces off against those giant beasts of the forest, Luffy immediately says that, you know, this takes him back. This brings back memories. He's obviously referring back to his time at Rusukaina Island, where he trained against the ferocious beasts of the island. And he, by the end of his training arc, he befriended all of them. He tamed all of them. He had mastered all of them. And then we also know that Luffy obviously grew up in the Grey Terminal, which like the Underworld is a very similarly dark and dangerous place. It's a place that generally has no hope, has no peace, it's very conflict ridden. It's a type of picture that Oda is trying to draw of the Underworld. So Loki saying that he's been friends with these wild beasts since he was a child, that seems to suggest that he spent a lot of time in the Underworld, potentially like Luffy growing up in the Grey Terminal, he grew up in the Underworld. And so when you start thinking about these parallels, the other one that is super clear that has been clear even from Loki's introduction in chapter 1130 is the fact that Loki also calls himself the sun god whereas we already know that Luffy is actually the he's currently the user of the Nika devil fruit he's currently the latest iteration the latest reincarnation of the sun god Nika and I have actually discussed this idea of Loki also being his own fated sun god or him being prophesized to be the sun god or at least related to the sun god in some way in another video of mine, I would also recommend you to go watch that video too. But for the purposes of today's discussion, I will just give you a brief outline. Essentially, my speculation, my hypothesis in that video was that Loki isn't actually evil. And I do go into greater detail in that other video. But essentially, I think this is some sort of misunderstanding. There's some sort of misunderstanding perhaps that involves Rodor, perhaps not. Either way, there is something that has gone wrong and has resulted in Loki 
being captured and tied up in the way that he is. And the great misunderstanding centers around the circumstances in how Loki killed his own father. I don't think that it was a brutal, vicious murder that the Obafians seem to believe it to be. I think Loki did kill King Harold, but he did so as per the traditions and customs of Elbaf. And I don't mean to say that patricide, that killing your own father, killing your own king is just part of the norms, part of the custom of Elbaf. What I really mean to say is that Loki and Harold, they fought, they battled like honorable warriors as per the customs, as per the warrior's code of Elbaf, and Loki just happened to prevail as its winner. So I alluded to this earlier in this discussion as well. Back in the Little Garden arc, we are introduced to this idea that when two parties, when two figures fight and they cannot come to a resolution when there's a conflict between two Elbafians that they can't come to resolve. They pass that on for the gods of Elbaf, for the god of Elbaf to decide and they decide to settle it via a death match. They decide that the god of Elbaf will decide who is right, who is wrong and the god will decide who gets to live. The person who is right gets to live. So my idea is that Loki and Harold had some dispute as to whether Loki should inherit that legendary devil fruit or not. This dispute was based on the fact that Loki has been the victim or has been a part of a long time curse or prophecy depending on which way you look at it because he is after all the accursed prince. It's been long foretold that Loki is going to be the harbinger of the doom of the world. Now Loki sees this as part of his prophecy something that he needs to fulfill almost as a birthright something that he has to fulfill because he is the sun god whereas King Harold he sees this as a curse. He doesn't want this fate for his son and he doesn't want the I guess the legacy of the Elbafian warriors to be someone who brought about the doom of the world. So they get into this dispute they can't decide who is right who is wrong and they instead decide to as per the customs and traditions of Elbaf settle it via a warrior's battle. Needless to say Loki ends up being the winner of that battle in his eyes and I guess in King Harold's eyes as well he has been declared the righteous he's been declared to be the one that's right he gets to survive and so in some manner this is an actually honorable battle and the death or the so-called killing of his father isn't a murder but just the outcome of what is a just and fair match however somehow this gets misunderstood somehow it comes to be that Loki actually viciously murdered his father rather than this being some sort of just killing just outcome and this is where Shanks gets involved so we obviously don't know the details yet but the likely conclusion that we're going to have to come to if we assume that Shanks was somehow involved in what happened to Loki six years ago and that's what resulted in him becoming the Yonko the most likely answer the most obvious answer is that Shanks helped the other giants capture Loki and this is what partly resulted in him becoming the Yonko so we know that Loki must have been incredibly strong and I would argue that he has been incredibly strong even before he acquired the legendary devil fruit from his father because how else would he have befriended and tamed all those terrible ferocious beasts of the underworld you know even as a child he was able to tame the wild beasts because he was that strong very Odin-esque very Luffy-esque so Loki is already strong by this point he then acquires a legendary devil fruit that then skyrockets his powers and the giants need help in capturing him for his so-called crimes and Shanks ends up being the one to help him because Shanks obviously is another very strong very formidable incredibly powerful figure so Shanks helps subdue Loki and this means that the giants are super grateful towards Shanks and so they agree to fly under Shanks's flag they agree to subdue themselves under Shanks's he, well, he's not an emperor at this point so he decides to you know they decide to join his crew they decide to join his fleet this brings Elbaf under Shanks's territory which means the world government has to recognize Shanks as a Yonko because he has the giants under his territory. I mean, what other pirate has achieved that? We know already how much the world government, how much the Marines have been obsessed with giants, how much they fear the strength of the giants. So if Shanks was able to bring them under his rule, under his authority, they come under his territory now, that's immediately Yonko worthy. So I think all of this up to this point is pretty easy to digest. But I do actually have to say that there is some sort of timeline confusion that I had to work out. If this is the story of how Shanks became a Yonko six years ago, then I started finding it a little off, a little odd how Loki's underlings in chapter 1131 referred to Shanks as a Yonko 
were in the present. And what I mean by this is when Shanks helped the giants capture Loki all those years ago, Shanks wouldn't have been a Yonko at that point. He wasn't a Yonko yet. And although it's pretty easy to assume that Loki somehow heard from the other giants that Shanks had then gone on to become a Yonko, the feeling that I got when I was reading chapter 1131 was that the underlings were referring to something that happened a lot more recently. They were referring to Shanks the Yonko because he was a Yonko when they got wiped out. And obviously a reference to them being wiped out is obviously a reference to Shanks's insane Conqueror's Haki Blast. And so if we suppose that this is something that happened a lot more recently, then it is plausible because we do know that the Red Hair Pirates and Shanks also visited Elba extremely recently, just before the events of Egghead Island, you know, just after the events of Wano. And so I started thinking that in between catching up with old pals and decimating the kid pirates, Shanks actually also visited Loki in the underworld. He went back to check in on Loki. You know, how are you going, mate? I'm sorry about six years ago. I'm sorry, but not really. Haha, ha, I'm a Yonko now. And then also blasts out Loki's underlings. Maybe Loki's underlings tried to defend Loki at some point, tried to attack Shanks for whatever reason. Shanks showed them who's boss. So let's just clean things up a bit. Let's just clarify and sort everything out because it's a bit of a mess at the moment. The timeline goes something like this. Shanks helps the Elbafian giants capture Loki. The Elbafians, in their thanks, in their gratitude, agree to come under his territory. Shanks becomes a Yonko. Fast forward some five to six years, Shanks visits Elbaf following the events of Wano. While at Elbaf, Shanks checks in on Loki. He wipes out Loki's underlings, leaves Elbaf, but not before wiping out the kid pirates as well. But I do think that there is more to this story than meets the eye. I think there are little other details that we have to unpack a little further here. The first or the most important being that if Shanks also helped the giants subdue Loki, this would supposedly then be an argument or a point that supports the idea that Loki actually is evil, that Loki actually is a bad guy that was rightfully subdued. Whereas if you go back to my theory earlier, I'm saying that Loki rightfully won his battle against King Harold, and so his capture, his sentence currently is actually unjust. It's not fair. So going by that logic, that would then point to Shanks is wrong. Shanks was wrong in helping out the giants. And I personally find that a little bit of a harder pill to swallow. I mean, I'm not going to say it's impossible that Shanks was wrong, but it seems unlikely just because of the character, the type of character that Shanks has been. Shanks throughout the entire series has been always two steps ahead. He always almost knows what move to make. It's almost as if he's clairvoyant, which is fitting because we actually know that he does have this extreme advanced Conqueror's Haki that allows him future sight, incredible future sight more so than other characters. Also ironic because his longtime rival, although no longer Mihawk, Mihawk was actually going to be called clairvoyant. That's a bit of a side story though. That's a bit of a tangent, not super relevant. What I mean to say though is that this doesn't fit with the image that we have of Shanks. Shanks Shanks isn't usually a character that makes mistakes that's usually wrong. We know him to be this character that actually understands all the pieces moving around on the table right now and acts accordingly. Which doesn't mean that he knows 100% what's going to happen because he did make a comment that, you know, he thought Blackbeard was going to show up at Wano when he didn't actually. So it's not like he knows for sure what everything's going to happen, but we still do know that Shanks to some level is wiser. I don't want to say the word omniscient, but almost. Anyways, so based on that logic, it then follows that isn't it actually a lot more likely that Shanks knows about the prophecy? You know, the prophecy concerning Loki, concerning why Loki actually had to kill his father. Isn't it more likely that as a character who understands the deep mysteries and the lore around the world, doesn't it make more sense that Shanks actually knew that Loki didn't viciously murder his father, but decided to tie up and capture Loki instead? And why would he do this, right? My my idea, my hypothesis, is that Shanks decided to capture Loki despite knowing that he didn't actually do anything technically wrong because he agreed with Loki that he should fulfill his prophecy, but Shanks, knowing everything that he does, also knew that it wasn't time for Loki to be unleashed into the world yet. Because if this uh, events that happened six years ago, Luffy hadn't started his journey then, Luffy hadn't been the pirate that he is today, Shanks knew that all all the pieces weren't in play yet. So Shanks decides to subdue Loki, and this means that Loki 
he develops rightfully, he rightfully develops this perception of Shanks as being cowardly, which is sort of the words that he used to describe him to Luffy, right? He says that it's a joke and he says that it was just to rile Luffy up, but it's obvious that he doesn't have a great, warm perception of Shanks, and that would be justifiable, that would be understandable if Shanks tied up Loki anyways because he didn't want to unleash Loki into the world when the world wasn't ready to for its downfall yet because they don't have the true sun god that's going to bring about the dawn of the world. And then that led me to wonder, is that the whole purpose of why Shanks went to Elba following Wano? It wasn't just to catch up with old friends, but it was actually to specifically check in on Loki. And not just check in on Loki, but actually to free Loki now. Because now we have to think about the timeline. Shanks goes in to check in on Loki following the events of Wano. And what happened at the end of Wano? Luffy unleashed his devil fruit. He unlocked his Nika abilities. He became the sun god, became a Yonko, meaning that the time is now right for Loki to fulfill his prophecy and bring about the end of the world. And for Luffy, the other piece of the puzzle, to bring about the dawn following the end of this world. Which then means Shanks was actually the one who's responsible for Loki getting loose. Which is is crazy, but I think very, very plausible. In chapter 1130, we find out that the new giant warrior pirates weren't able to go with Dory and Broggy to help retrieve Luffy, and that was because some trouble occurred concerning Loki. And we don't exactly know what trouble means, but it seemed like, it very much seemed like Loki had temporarily escaped. What if Shanks is the one that actually untied Loki? What if Shanks is the one that helped Loki escape? Whereas previously, he helped capture Loki because he knew it wasn't time, now he knows that it is time and he's helped free Loki instead. Now I have to admit this is a pretty left field theory, some crazy speculations going on, but the more I think about this idea, the more I'm actually falling in love with it. And I feel like the timelines actually do match up. But as always, I would love to hear what you would have to say, what you guys think of this idea, so let me know by leaving a comment below. If you enjoyed today's discussion, make sure to like the video, but also please do subscribe because believe you me, I have lots and lots more crazy One Piece discussions, some less crazy, some even crazier. Love to share my thoughts with you all, so please subscribe. If you also want to support the channel even further, you can also become a Patreon or channel member like these wonderful, wonderful people. But as always, thank you so much for listening to another one of my crazy ramblings. This is Joy Girl, and I'll see you again soon.